You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Between the four of us talking tonight, we have Iowa State University, DNR, City of Iowa City, and Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. So I'm going to start off the first part. Uh, my name is Mike Kittner. I'm with Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And I'm going to kind of do a basic overview of Emerald Ash Borer, what it looks like, what damage it causes, uh, where did it come from, and kind of where is it right now in the United States. So if you have questions throughout, um, feel free to raise your hand, ask a question, and we'll do our best to address your questions. Um, it's not a huge crowd, so I don't think we'll be slowed down at all. So and it, with in doubt, with what we're, the topic we're talking about, if you have a question, ask. Otherwise, you can ask at the end as well. So the first couple slides, I just want to show some pictures of the impact the Emerald Ash Borer has. Uh, pictures will help visualize for sure. This is a nice residential street lined with ash trees. Obviously, so this is before Emerald Ash Borer hits. This is what happens after Emerald Ash Borer hits and has a chance to kill off the trees. Luckily, this is in Iowa yet, but there are some communities here in Iowa that are suffering some huge impacts from Emerald Ash Borer already. Uh, a couple that come to mind are Waterloo and Burlington, Iowa. Luckily, this is not what Iowa City looks like yet. Not only with dying trees, but the damage that emerald ash borer causes. Uh, there's risk factors. Trees fall on houses. Trees call, fall on cars. Um, they can pose a, a, you know, a safety concern to people, pedestrians walking. So uh, there, there's a lot of things that are bad with this insect. Here's just the before and after picture. Uh, this is in Ohio of what Emerald Ash Borer can do to community. Um, just in three short years, you can see in 2006 on the left, trees are nice leafed out, nice full canopy, and three, out, or three years later, trees are basically dead. All, all gone, these should pretty much be removed. They shouldn't even really be standing. Um, the one tree that's further back there that you see the foliage on on the right hand towards the back is actually I've been told it's a maple tree, so that's why it still has leaves on it. So Emerald Ash Borer, you probably saw, we had a lot of handouts in case you didn't get to those in the back. Um, a lot of information on Emerald Ash Borer, but kind of the basics here, it is an invasive insect. Uh, it's not native to the United States. It came from Asia, and you can see the map up here in the right-hand corner. Um, the light green is kind of showing the, the native range of where Emerald Ash Borer came from. It was first found here in the United States in 2002, so not all that long ago. Um, and that was in Detroit, Michigan. And Emerald Ash Borer attacks and kills ash trees. So anything in the Fraxinus species, for instance, green ash, white ash, blue ash, black ash. Uh, we get questions sometimes about mountain ash. Emerald ash borer does not attack mountain ash because it's not a true Fraxinus species. So far, Emerald ash borer, since it's been tracked and been spotted here in the United States, it's already killed tens of millions of ash trees. And those numbers are going to continue to rise as the insect spreads further and further. Pictures here, uh, the map on the bottom left just shows the range of ash trees in the United States, the native range. So anywhere in the green on the US map is where there's ash trees and where the emerald ash borer can fly, infest, and kill more trees. Uh, the bottom right hand picture is just a forested area of pictures. A lot of times we're thinking about the trees just in our yard or in front of our house or at the park we like to visit. But keep in mind there's a lot of forested trees out there too that are going to um, fall to the prey of emerald ash borer. So number-wise, in the United States, or I'm sorry, in Iowa, we have about 52 million woodland ash trees and about 3.1 million, 3 .1 million urban ash trees. So what does emerald ash borer look like? 
We have in the, the vials in the back um, on the table there, there actually are a couple with the adult beetle in it. If you've looked at it, they're very, very small. Um, I actually carry, I know it's kind of weird, but I carry my keychain, emerald ash borer with me about all the time because I get so many questions about it. There it is, it's, it, if you can even see it, it's, it's very small. Uh, it's a metallic green beetle, only about a half an inch long. Um, if the wings were to be lifted up, there's a bright magenta color underneath there. And this is a good um, thing that we use a lot, is if, if you were to find a beetle and you think it might be emerald ash borer, pull out a penny, place it on the penny, and if it goes across Lincoln's bust there, just like that, it could potentially be emerald ash borer. A lot of the beetles that we find are going to be bigger than that. Here's just a picture of um, a lot of the samples that are sent in. Uh, for instance, at Iowa State, um, DNR, I think it's some, we get some uh, that people think might be emerald ash borer. Uh, believe it or not, the cicada does get sent in sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, the six-spotted tiger beetle has a, a pretty shiny color on it too. Uh, that gets confused sometimes with emerald ash borer. So. But that's the real deal up there, the top left-hand um, picture. That's emerald ash borer. So you can kind of get a, see the size comparison of, um, and the looks to the other beetles or whatever insects, I should say. The emerald ash borer is a beetle, so it goes through complete metamorphosis uh, from eggs all the way to adults. And here's just a, a display of, from eggs to larvae, pupae, and adults, and what those stages look like. Um, the adults, the shiny green ones that are going to be flying around, are going to be present anytime between June and August here in Iowa. So that's when you're going to see them. If you think you saw one in your garage last week or coming out a piece of firewood and in your backyard, you know, a couple weeks ago, it was an emerald ash borer. If you think you see it in October or sometime, you know, anytime further after August, it's probably not emerald ash borer. So keep in mind, the beetle is going to be flying around anywhere between June and August. So when the adult beetle comes out, it does feed on the ash leaves. Um, it's called maturation feeding, and then uh, they, you know, they grow and develop, and then basically the, the female does lay eggs in the bark crevices of ash trees, the tree that they're going to attack once those eggs hatch. The eggs are very small. Um, female adult can lay anywhere from, on average, to about 60 to 90 eggs. And after they hatch, they turn into these little grub-like, we refer them to sometimes, but they're, this is a single larva. It will go underneath, burrow underneath the bark and begin feeding. And yeah? 60 to 90 once a year? Yes. Question was how many eggs once a year? 60 to 90 eggs once a year per the female. Per female. Uh, you'll see the thing with emerald ash borer, there's a lot of uh, larvae that will look like that. This one has bell-shaped segments. So that's something to think about. And there's, like I say, uh, good information back there that can point that out. On top of the two adults back in the vials, we also have two of the larvae for samples to look at. If you want to look at those during break or on your way out, if you haven't already seen them. This is a stage that is causing the damage to the tree and killing it. It's not the adults. So as this larva grows and develops and gets bigger, it's, it's, eating, it's basically eating away underneath the, the bark of the tree. And in doing so, it's creating these, these galleries or tunneling, serpentine galleries, whatever you want to call it, and it's disrupting the movement of water nutrients in the tree. So as those numbers build up and more and more larvae attack and more and more tunnels start to fill in a tree, the tree basically becomes dried out and the, you know, the tissues become dry and brittle. And we saw that with the previous pictures. Once that happens, branches can drop and trees be become a hazard. 
after they go from larva, they go to the pupae stage underneath there, and that's about the deepest they're gonna go in the, in the tree. That's kind of their resting stage before, during the winter time, before they're gonna come out and hatch to be adults. Next. When the adults come out, like we talked about any time between June and August, they're gonna exit the tree and create a D-shaped hole, and here's an adult about to come out. So kind of to pinpoint more exactly when you know, the peak activity emerald ash borer is, I just threw up this map. Um, you can see in, here in Iowa kind of about where we're at is about mid-June. Those are when they're going to be actively flying around. As seasons can change from uh, year to year and the season, depending on the spring is, uh, a good thing we use sometimes is plant indicators when certain plants are in bloom. And we do know that when the black locust is in bloom is when EAB is out and, and, and present. So if you're familiar with black locust, you can always use that as an indicator plant. So just a brief history. Um, does anyone have an idea where emerald ash borer came from, since it's native? Any guesses? Kind of where I showed up on that map? China, China? OK. That's good, yep. Most people probably say China, or how did it get here? Um, wooden crates, cargo ships, and then it landed in Detroit. I don't think it's been actually proven, but that's, that's the theory, and that's kind of what we're sticking to. Um, like I said before, it was found here in 2002, but now that we've learned more about the insect, we're kind of finding out that it might have been here actually 10 years prior to 2002. We just didn't, we hadn't located or found it. So, in 2002, it hit Detroit, and then we started tracking it. We found out this was a, a, you know, a pest that we definitely had our eyes on. I'll make a comment that some pests were able to eradicate, kill, and stop the movement of. We found out kind of early on that emerald ash borer is not that type of insect. Um, the problem with it is that usually when we find it, it's, it's, a, it's a delayed response on our end. It's already been there for several years, two, three, four years. It just depends. So anyhow, we tracked, and this is basically USDA doing track work. And so 2005, you can see already three years later, after we first found it in Detroit, it is spread into Indiana, Ohio, and a little bit in Ontario there. 2009, spreading even further. You can see some of the satellite populations building up. And it's not spreading like a big wave, like a wildfire. It's, there are populations, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why that might be going on. And here's the current map. Um, every county on the map that has a red dot has been confirmed with emerald ash borer. So, all the way as far west as Boulder, Colorado there, and you can see it down in the south in Louisiana and Georgia. And this is just a visual for 2015. All the red counties had detections last year. So emerald ash borer, when it moves through an area, uh, it's, it's really doing damage to ash trees, especially when the numbers build up. In heavily infested areas, in woodland areas, you can see the, the figure there, it's killing 99% of the ash trees. So it's not like a hit and miss thing, or I cross my finger and hope it doesn't attack my tree. It's pretty much hitting every single tree. <coughs> okay, more specific to <coughs> Iowa. Um, Alamakee County is the first county we found it in, very northeast county, and that was back in 2010. So Detroit, 2002, was first discovered. It wasn't discovered here until eight years after that. <coughs> it was right along the Mississippi River there. Uh, you can kind of see on the map, Wisconsin and Minnesota had some detections here. So there was some pest pressure. It's just a matter of time until it creeped in to the Iowa side. 
And sure enough, it happened in 2010. So in 2010, we had only one county found. It was that Alamakee County. And then in 2013, three years later, we added four more counties to the map. So there was a little, little downtime there from 2010 to 2013. Um, and then it's kind of it's kind of ramped up since then um, 2014 we found 13 counties and in 2015 we found 11 counties so currently right now we're sitting at 31 counties confirmed positive for emerald ash borer in Iowa and you can see that this year unfortunately Johnson County was added Like I said earlier, um, this took the finding in Johnson County was in, in February. It was in Iowa City and was on the University of Iowa campus. Uh, here's just a graph showing, a chart showing um, the effects that emerald hash borer has on, on a tree ash tree community after it moves into an area. We kind of refer this to the death curve sometimes. Um, the longer EAB is in the area, let's say, um, you know, this is the years after it's been detected. So about six years after initial detection, you can see that the, ash, the, the tree mortality, percent tree mortality, which is on the left-hand side, begins to ramp up. So basically anywhere between about six years and about 12 years or 13 years, ash trees are going to start to die faster and faster and more and more and more in quantity. So keep that in mind. Yes, it was found here in Iowa City recently. Um, you, you might have seen on the news or heard on the radio, read in the paper, and maybe next summer you're thinking, oh, my ash tree hasn't died yet. You know, were they hyping this up? Um, it is a real deal. Um, just give it some time and you're going to start really noticing ash trees being affected by emerald ash borer. So going back to that map, we had the satellite populations. How is it moving around in the United States? How's, how's it getting around so far? Um, EAB moves one of two ways. Can move one of two ways. One is natural movement. Um, it's a beetle, so it flies around. The good thing for us is it doesn't fly very far. Um, it, it can fly maybe up to two miles, but generally speaking, it's going to stay in close. It tends to attack the same tree over and over and over again. Um, the figure I've heard about 60% of the beetles go back to the same tree, attack the tree. So um, luckily, they're going to stay close. As long as the food sources, they're not going to fly out very far. The reason that that's really moving distances and creating satellite populations is because people. We're moving it around in ash logs and nursery stock and firewood and you know anything that you can put on that's infested put it on with it has wheels on it um, we're contributing to the spread so we're helping it move faster unfortunately an effort to slow down the spread there are federal quarantines in place and here's a map just showing the federal quarantine and the things that I kind of touched on, you know, for instance, ash logs, um, all hardwood, firewood, things like that, need to stay within the yellow areas, need to stay within the quarantine. Those are called ash regulated articles. And in an effort to keep it from spreading to new areas, you want it to keep it within the yellow areas. So if you have, for instance, hardwood, firewood, and you want to go to uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, you wouldn't be able to take hardwood firewood there because you'd be leaving the yellow area, going out of a yellow area. You can always move into a yellow area, you just cannot move out of a yellow area. Now, there are exceptions. You can get permits and work through that, but generally speaking, that's how the federal quarantine works. Um, it does have impact on people. Uh, producers of firewood, uh, we work with companies closely to help them get the paperwork they need and the right type of treatments they do to move it. 
Uh, we work with loggers that move ash logs out of um, Iowa or even out of the country. Um, so it's not like they have to stay here, but <coughs> just keep in mind paperwork needs to, needs to happen in order to, uh, for them to be shipped out of the quarantine area. These maps are updated all the time. And there's a couple of websites where you can source that quarantine map. If you have questions, there's also phone numbers um, to call if you have any questions about the quarantine itself. So just to touch on again, the regulated articles about the quarantine is ash tree debris, de debris, ash nursery stock, uh, non-heated ash lumber, and hardwood bark chips that are greater than one inch in two dimensions. Campgrounds, um, I find this map kind of interesting because it, it, it kind of goes to show how much firewood movement is going on around the United States. Um, it's, it's amazing when I've heard the figures before, um, estimates I should say, but people move firewood everywhere. They are always put it in their camper, the back of their pickup truck, um, and then we wonder why things are spreading so quickly. So we promote um, keeping firewood, things such as firewood, closely, um, not letting it move. First of all, not letting it move out of the quarantine, but second of all, try to keep it as local as possible. Just because if you're in the quarantine, you saw all of Iowa was quarantined, um, but we would promote not moving it here from Iowa City all the way up to, for instance, like Sioux City, because it hasn't been found in Sioux City. Yes, you can legally do it, but it's probably not the best thing to do. So. Keep your firewood local. And not just for the sake of moving emerald ash borer, there's a lot of other pests and diseases that are here, either here now or on the horizon, and we want to keep that um, in consideration. So what to look for with EAB? You know, you're going to go out in your yard, or you're wondering if you have EAB in your tree. Um, probably the biggest one, especially in the summertime, is a thinning canopy, thinning top of the tree. Uh, the thing about emerald ash borer, it attacks at the top first of the top of the tree, so you're not going to be down looking at the trunk. You need to actually be looking up. Um, here's some pictures of what the tree would look like. You can see the thinning leaves are becoming really spindly and yellow and might be a lot smaller. Uh, these trees were both positive for emerald ash borer. Um, you were a tree in this condition, you probably would have already noticed it in the fall. I mean, a tree would have been declining. I don't think uh, if it was this bad, it would have been bad in the fall, too. But yes, you, give, the chance, give the tree a little chance to leaf out in the spring and then evaluate the condition. I wouldn't uh, do it right when it's leafing out. Just have, let, the chance, let the tree. Ch you know, have a chance to put on some good growth and then evaluate how the top looks. So besides decline, another thing you can look for is woodpecker activity in the tree. Um, especially this time of year, if you've noticed it in your tree, um, higher up in the upper half, uh, that may be an indicator of emerald ash borer. They fleck away at the bark of the tree and then a lot of times you'll see in that little light colored fleck area, you'll see a little hole in there. That's where the woodpecker went in to feed on that larva that's underneath the bark. So here's the little holes there you can see. So if you had that in your yard, I'd, there'd be a little bit of concern. And here's just a few more flecking pictures of what the woodpeckers do in an effort to feed on the larvae. Another thing is that as they're feeding underneath the bark, sometimes the bark will split. And you can see those galleries underneath that we showed on, the, on a slide a little bit ago um, within that, that split on the bark. So if you look really closely, there's the galleries in there. And then if sometimes there's a lot of loose bark on the tree, if you see it lower, and if this is a picture on the right, you just pull off the bark. And they're all underneath there. I guess I was going to answer, you sort of answered my question. Would it look like the picture on the right, or do you have to peel some loose bark back to, to see that? It's not going to show that on its yeah. own. 
The question was on the picture on the right, do you have to actually peel that back to see that? Generally, yes. Uh, the bark is usually really lightly attached to the tree. So if you just barely pull it off, if it's bad enough, it will pull off. Um, I suppose the wind or some animal could pull it off too, but generally speaking, you have to pull it off. Well, loose bark is a cool Loose bark, yep. There's a picture of the D-shaped exit holes again as it comes out of the tree. Um, in the comparison next to the penny, they're very, very small. It's not typically something that you're looking for. In fact, if you see D-shaped exit holes and if they were caused by emerald ash borer, um, if you see them at, at head level, um, you pretty much know that it's progressed all the way from the top, because remember, it attacks the top of the tree first and made it progress all the way down to the trunk. And your tree's probably shown other things besides just the D-shaped exit holes by that time. But they're D-shaped because the beetle's kind of got a round stomach on it, if you want to call it that, and a flat back. So that's what the, the shape it creates when it exits the tree. And lastly is these uh, emerald ash borer attack trees can have this epicormic um, sprouting on the trunk or maybe possibly larger branches. And that's because as, as it's killing the tissue off in the tree and working its way down, uh, the tree's trying to put on a lot of extra growth in effort to combat back and try to stay alive. There's a lot of reserves in the roots still, so it's, it's flushing on growth in effort to, to kind of stay alive. So you can see those epicormic sprouts either during you know, the, the growing season when there's leaves on the tree, or you can even notice them in the winter time. And lastly, this is the last one, the foliage feeding. The, we talked about the adult beetles do maturation feeding. And when they do so, they notch out little notches in the leaves. So sometimes um, I will use it, and you kind of pretty much need binoculars, but you can look up in the tree and see if there's notches up. Again, they're going to be attacking at the top of the tree. They like to be basking where the sun is, uh, where the light is. So you really need to look up. If you're seeing maturation feeding really low in the tree, um, it's, it's probably not the, the best place to be looking for it. Yes? Um. I believe you had me on a slide that showed how many uh, urban trees and how many woodland trees in Iowa were ashes. Actually, I think it said 52 million uh, woodland or something like 5 million or something like that. Urban. What, can you tell me, you had a handle on what percentage of trees in Iowa that 52 million trees is? Woodland trees or what urban trees? What percentage of woodland and urban trees are ash trees in Iowa? Um, you're pretty close on the numbers. The, the 52 million was the uh, woodland, and the 3.1 million was urban. Unfortunately, I don't have a percentage to share. Um, a lot of communities around Iowa have done, you know, tree inventories, so there's kind of some inventories. But generally speaking, I think the number I hear about a lot for uh, public trees in the community statewide, I think hovers around 17, 18 percent. So that's, I have that figure, but statewide for all trees, there's so many woodland trees, I just, I wouldn't know. Good question though. Okay, any other questions for that, those topics I talked about? Yes? Do they favor really big trees or is it equally young and huge trees? Okay, great, great question. Does emerald ash borer attack just big trees or do they like small trees or any tree? they will attack basically any size tree. Um, they'll attack all the way very down to small size trees to big ones. Um, they, the bad thing too is they will attack both healthy and stressed trees, but they do prefer stressed trees. Yes? Do they attack all species of ashes and are there any related species that they attack that aren't ashes? Okay. Do they attack all species of ash trees? Anything in the Fraxinus. So all the ash, basically any of the ash trees in Iowa, they're gonna attack. And there's a huge list, but like I was mentioning, basically the green ash and the white ash are probably the biggest in Iowa. And then we got some blue ash and black ash as well. Um, outside of the ash, there is a new um, host, the white fringe tree. And you might not hear about that as much. It's not really a big landscape tree in, in Iowa, but uh, I, there probably are some out there. But it can attack white fringe trees. Besides those two, the white fringe tree and ash, 
at this time, there's nothing. Yeah. Yes? After all the ash trees are gone, what happens to the ash borers? Do they move on to some secondary species? Great question. After the ash trees are all gone, yeah. After the ash trees are all gone, does you know are they going to move on to another another species? Are the emerald ash borer attack something else? Uh, I guess time will tell. Uh, there are a lot some related things that fall under the same family as ash, you know, privet and lilacs and things like that. We just don't know yet. Um, time will tell. Yes. Is there any way to get rid of them if you have an ash tree that's infested? Is there anything you can uh, well, there are ways to hopefully protect your tree from attack. Um, and Dr. Shara will be talking about that in a little bit. But no, there's no, there, there's no silver bullet, unfortunately. Yes? I just wanted to clarify about the woodpeckers, because I've always had woodpeckers occasionally visiting my ash tree. But you said they would be trying to collect the bark off. Mm -hmm. Woodpeckers attacking an ash tree, um, you're going to be wanting, yeah, they, they're going to be flecking the bark off. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that woodpeckers can be flecking the bark off of a tree, maybe not necessarily just for emerald ash borer. There are a lot of native borers that attack trees too, so they could possibly be feeding on those. I will say in my experience though, when I see the flecked off bark and I also see the, the feeding hole where they took the larvae out, if I see those two things in association, I have more reason to have concerns that emerald ash borer is there. The thing about emerald ash borer is it's been attacking ash trees in its homeland for hundreds and hundreds of years. The thing is that they have different types of ash trees over there. Um, the thing about insects is a lot, they, they, tend, they tend to have a kind of a narrow host range, not always, but especially in the case of like emerald ash borer, for some reason, you know, they just evolved to attack ash trees. Um, and if you were to take some of their trees over from Asia, for example, their native trees and bring them to the United States and put them right next to our trees that are native here, they will, our emerald ash borer will tend to go to our trees, attack them first versus the native trees from Asia because Emerald ash borers co-evolved through many, 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 many years with the ash trees over in Asia, where that has not happened here in the United States yet. So our de the defense mechanisms in our native ash trees are not the same as they are over in Europe or in Asia. Is it the thought someday we'll be able to get some ash trees from over there and bring them here? Or probably? There's um, a, lot of, a lot of breeding work being done, uh, resistance of ash trees. There, there is hope that we'll be able to have um, grow and produce trees here in the United States that are resistant to ash. To uh, add to that hope, think about the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We were talking about Dutch elm disease. We are now planting American elms again across the United States because they have found native American elms that have tolerance that they've actually regenerated that they are now replanting that are surviving. So, but it's taken since the 50s or longer. So it could be 50, 60, 70 years before that happens. The other thing that's happening at Iowa State, it's a USDA program, but they are collecting seed throughout the Midwest to protect the genetic variability of our native ash, so they're collecting seed all over the U.S. and keeping that seed so if things change, we still have that genetic seed source too as we look to progress longer. So the topic I'm going to, one of the topics I'm going to talk about tonight is I get a lot of calls, people concerned about do they have emerald ash borer and they'll send me pictures. 20% of the time when they send me a picture of their tree, it's not an ash. So I'm going to teach you really quick <laughs> how to make sure that you have an ash so you don't have something else. The other reason that's important though, who am I? Oh, who am I? The question was who am I? I'm Mark Vitash. I'm a DNR district forester. I cover six counties in, in this region. Um, thank you, sorry. Um, 
Now you threw me off. <laughs> so when people call, uh, the other reason identification is important, though, is like in any other business, in any other thing, there's going to be people out there that are going to try to take advantage of folks. And there are people out there now that are telling people to treat their trees, and those trees are not ash. They're actually selling products and saying, we're going to treat your ash tree, and if that person doesn't know and respects them and listens to them, they're, they're frauding people. So just to protect, I, I don't expect a lot of that, but anytime we have these kind of things, you always have potential of those problems, so it's best to protect. The other thing is um, the iowatreepest.com website that Mike was talking about, there's a publication on there that talks about identification of ash, too, so you can follow up there. And Iowa State University and Virginia Tech both have good websites on identification also. So I'm just going to touch on it briefly. First thing that you got to know is what is a leaf. And with any tree, the way you find a leaf is you got to find the bud first. So some people will look at this and say, well, that's a leaf. Or some will look at that and say, that's a leaf. Well, you got to find the bud. And so from that bud out is what your leaf is. On a maple, or I'm sorry, on a cottonwood, that's a leaf. That's called a simple leaf. Okay, that's one leaf. On an ash, that whole thing is one leaf. That's called a compound leaf. And these are actually leaflets. So when you're looking at identification in ID books, one of the first questions they'll ask you, does it have simple leaves or compound leaves? So that's really important in identification. There is one exception with ash, though. There actually is a single leaf ash out there. It's a European selection, and there's a few in Iowa City. Uh, when I was a forestry student at Iowa State a few years ago, I came back one weekend from my dendrology class, and I was just testing myself, and I found this tree. It had all the characteristics of ash, but it had a simple leaf. I had learned that they all had compound. Um, took it back to my instructor and found out there is an exception. There is one single leaf ash variety out there, but that's not very common. Um, if you ever want to see them, there's some along First Avenue over by City High. Uh, but most have a compound leaf. Most of our common ash that we're going to deal with have a compound leaf. And depending on the species, they might have 8 to 12 leaflets, seven to five, or 5 to 7 leaflets, or 8 to 11 leaflets, depending on the species. So the other thing that ash produce is they produce a seed that's a wing, but it's a single wing, kind of like the end of your canoe paddle. Okay, that's kind of think about it. it. It flies just like the maples, but it's a single wing rather than a double wing like maples. But most of your ash are going to produce that. Now, some of our urban selections, though, are male selections, so they may not produce seed. So you may have some trees that don't produce the seed. The other key characteristic with ash compared to other species is the way the buds are arranged on that branch. And with ash, they're opposite, so they're in pairs compared to some species have what they call alternate, where the buds alternate from side to side as you go down the branch, things like oak and elm. But on ash, that means the branches are also opposite, so you can even see that identification in the wintertime. The reason that's kind of important for our native species, there's only a couple species that have opposite branches, basically the ash, maples, and buckeye, which is more common in southern Iowa, but those are really the only three that there are some ornamental selections from Europe and other places or China that have opposite. But most of our native trees, there's only two or three that have opposite. So it's kind of that elimination um, when you get into that. The other thing with ash compared to, I, t I told you, maple is one that also has opposite. Well, on maples, this right here is a leaf scar. Well, this is ash, and the, and the leaf scar on ash is a shield shape. On maples, it's a V shape. So if you have opposite, and you think, well, it's maple or ash. If it's V, it's probably maple. If it's a shield shape, it's some type of ash. So there's little things like that that can help you in identification. Obviously, if that branch is clear up in the tree, you're not going to be able to see that. But if you have branches that you can see, that can help. This is typical ash bark, especially as it matures. It's different when it's young. But on most species, as it gets older, it gets kind of a crisscrossy bark. Pretty, pretty uh, usual characteristic on ash. But this is all the things together, and this is green ash, 
you know, green ash and white ash are probably the most common ash that have been planted. Pretty much all I see. There's a few exceptions, and I'll show you one. But most stuff that we see are either green ash, and you hear a lot of Marshall seedless ash, which is green ash, or you hear autumn applause or autumn purple. That's white ash. So this is white ash. And the one difference between green and white, green will have yellow fall color, and the white ash will have purple fall color. That's one really easy way to tell those two apart. We can also even get to the detail of looking at the shield shape because on white ash, the bud actually sits down in the leaf scar, down in there, like it makes kind of a smiley face. And on green ash, the bud sits right on top. It's a lot of specific things, but there's little specific things we can use to tell the difference, okay? So green, green ash versus white ash. Green is yellow, white is purple. The other thing we can look at is the way the leaflets are attached. On green ash, that leaflet comes right up against that second stem. And on white ash, it has almost a second stem there, OK? So that there's a separation here between the leaflet and this stem. And here, it's right directly attached. That's another way to tell green from white, OK? There's a few other things, even their shape and form the white ash tend to be kind of a rounder shape, and the uh, green ash tend to be a little more upright in their form. And like I said, you can look at the leaf scars too. This is black ash. It, before emerald ash, uh, ash borer started coming in in 2002 when we started talking about it, I would say in the late 90s, people were really starting to plant a lot of black ash. They hadn't before. It um, has a really nice gold fall color. They really started to pick up in the industry. So it's not very common, but I know there's been some, there's some planted downtown by the old brown bottle. There's some in front there if they, if they haven't disappeared yet. Um, what's that? By the rec center. By the rec center. Um, but they have a bark that's a little different. It's a little more spongy. It doesn't have that crisscrossy characteristic that the green and white ash have. Um, the buds are black on black ash. Uh, and it has more leaflets, and it just has a different texture. You may or may not have this one. It's, like I say, it's not super common, but I would say green and white, and probably green is the most common, thin white, and then you'll see a little bit of black ash. We also have one called blue ash. It's not very common, but on it, the twigs have corky bark on the edges, kind of like uh, uh, burning bush euonymus, but the, the the branch itself has little corky bark all the way along the edges. Question? So if the tree that you're looking at is more than 40 or 50 years old, it's probably not black ash. If, if your tree is more than 40, 50 years old, there's probably a good chance it isn't black ash unless you live where maybe there was a horticulturist or somebody who liked a lot of different species and was trying. But yeah, I mean, there's still a chance. But I would say it's been, it was more common in the last 25, 30 years. Good question. Okay, so that's it on ID. It was just really quick. Then I'm going to cover one other quick thing here. So Dr. Schauer is going to talk about uh, treatment potential. But the one thing I really try to stress to people is before you consider treatment, you have to make sure that your tree is treatment worthy, that it's a candidate for treatment. I think there's a few trees out there, or more than a few sometimes, people for different reasons want to treat them, but there may be a reason why it's really not justified. So we're going to explain that a little bit, and Dr. Schauer will get more specific when he talks about treatment choices. So this is obviously a healthy ash tree. The one thing to remember about ash, I would say the average lifespan of an ash is probably somewhere between 40 and 70 years. There are exceptions, just like anything else. But I've been doing this for about 29 years, believe it or not, and I've seen a lot of ash die, and they usually die between 40 and 70 years if they do. I have seen a 100-year-old ash tree, so it can happen. But if you think about our urban environments, they're pretty tough environments around our houses and our downtown areas. Some of our areas where the soil may not be as good. That's a tough environment for any tree. Um, 
in urban areas, the average tree age in our communities is only about 40 years. When you get into a park area, that may go up to 70 or more. But in, a, in any tree in those areas, it can be tough. So keep that in mind if you have an ash tree. Again, you may have an exception, but you're probably somewhere in that 40 to 70. So this is a healthy tree. Obviously, this is not. If I have a tree that's already showing stress or is already declining, even if it doesn't have emerald ash borer, treating that tree for emerald ash borer is not going to save that tree. If it's declining from something else, it has a disease, or it's just in general decline because of the site, treating it is not going to make it better. Okay, So keep that in mind. Just more decline. Mike was talking about different symptoms to look for. Again, not a healthy tree, not a good candidate. Maybe you've got a tree that's got really poor root structure, or this is actually a girdling root that is growing into the tree, or the tree's trying to grow around it. Structurally, this tree could have problems, and long term, that tree could have problems. So again, you need to look at the whole tree and, and see if it's healthy. Do you have decay? Or do you have severe wounds that could be problems later on? Or again, if I have a tree like this right here next to my house, if it's hollow and only has a couple inches of solid wood, is that a tree that I should even have next to my house? So again, you've got to evaluate to make sure that it's worth keeping. Maybe you have mushroom growth. This is a mushroom that shows that you have some internal decay. It could be a smaller mushroom, any kind of mushroom that's growing off the bark that looks like it's internal could be some indication. Do you have squirrels that like to live in your tree? That tree needs to be closer, close, more closely looked at to make sure that there's not some interior defects that that tree maybe is not the safest tree in that place. Do I have a split? This tree has already failed. It already has a trunk failure there. That tree's not a good tree. That's probably not a tree that I'm going to consider treatment. Now, I'm showing you all these bad trees. There are good trees out there, even ash trees, that do have good structure, that are healthy, maybe at a good age where if you really want to consider treatment, that could be a good choice, OK? If you've got a tree like this, it's probably time to take it down, OK? This is my tree in my yard. This tree is 56 years old. I am not treating this tree. Because I know when the house was built. <laughs> the question was, how do I know? I know when the house was built. And in this neighborhood, most of the trees were planted. So plus or minus a couple years, OK? And, and based on the size, I know it's probably close to what I think it is. How would you determine the age of our own ash trees? The question is, how would you determine the age of your own ash? The one thing to remember, ash are kind of sneaky, is they do grow fairly fast. Because um, you could have a 25 to 30 foot tree that's maybe only 15 to 18 years old. Um, but if you have a diameter, that's 20 inches plus. You say that. How high up the tree do you measure? I'm, measure, I'm measuring the diameter at four and a half feet off. Four and a half feet. Okay. So if you have one that's 20 inch plus, um, you're probably looking at a tree that's at least 30 years old, okay? Give or take. Because the site and species, but that's a good question. Um, but in this case, my tree is already starting to show some decline symptoms um, based on its growth and other characteristics. I mean, it. This is not during the growing season, so there's no leaves on it. That's not what it normally looks like. This is a green ash. Um, it's 26 inches in diameter. But based on what I know, I know this tree, I'm lucky if it, if it lives another five to eight years. So for me to treat that tree is probably not worth it, because even if I treat it, it's going to decline from other causes. Again, I could have an exception. So you have to evaluate that situation to make sure treatment's the best option. Obviously, in this situation, this is a nice tree. The, the question also comes up if, in some cases, people go, well, it's the only tree in my yard. That may impact your decision also, as far as one good option sometimes, if you have a, an area, depending on your treating or not, is just to plant another tree of another species. And we'll talk about that a little later, too. But in this case, a lot of times I get people to call and say, I have one tree. It's an ash, and it's the only tree in my yard. 
and there's only room for one tree. So what do I do then? Even in that case, though, you've got to make sure that that tree is worth treating. Okay? What would you guess on the age of that one? That, um, that tree right there is probably uh, about 25 years old. Great questions. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Schauer. Okay, my name is Mark Schauer. I'm an entomologist with Iowa State. Uh, most of my time is spent on pesticide safety education. I have also been asked uh, Iowa City to help them uh, transition to school IPM integrated pest management, which I'm thrilled to be able to do that uh, as well. But tonight I'm going to talk about treatment for emerald ash borer. Uh, I appreciate you coming tonight. Um, we're going to get some snow. <laughs> Dirty word almost. Okay, Mark set a stage very well. When we're talking about treatment for emerald ash borer, you're going to have to make a hard decision. Sometimes you don't like to make the decision, but you still need to make it because it's a costly decision, okay? Either way you go, it's going to cost money. If this bug had never come to Iowa or never come to our country, we'd be sitting on more money. But if we have an ash tree or several ash trees, like I have 14 in my yard, I have some financial decisions to make, okay? So these are the three that I like to just narrow it down to. Preemptive removal, get rid of the tree before it comes. Deferred removal, we'll talk about what that is, and then uh, a preventive treatment. So as Mark said, 40 to 70 years, 75 years in a, rural, in a rural setting, 75 years is good. For 40 years in an urban setting, because of all the mystery soil, what's beneath the grass, we don't know. You talked about some structural problems already, distinct side issues. One thing you didn't mention was uh, weather. Weather has wreaked havoc on a lot of our large trees, including our ash trees, uh, blowing the top out. We get uh, late frost when uh, I know several years ago on Mother's Day, uh, we had beautiful leaves out and all of a sudden we got hit with a hard frost and knocked all the leaves off. Okay, that's hard on the trees over a period of time. So if you've got some issues like this, that you already know you might have some issues or girdling roots or whatever, you want to consider taking that tree out. It's less costly to take that tree out when the tree is still alive than it is when it dies. If it dies with emerald ash borer or any other malady, as Mike said, the tree becomes brittle because those larvae are working on cutting off the plumbing of the tree. The top part of the tree get, dries out and then becomes brittle and a, a climber can't get up there, cannot get up there. So you have to use a bucket truck or a crane to remove the tree. So that's going to be more expensive to bring that equipment on the site than if they could go up the tree with their spikes and take off the tree branches bit by bit, okay? So that's part of the cost issue. So that's the first, really the first thing is, is trying to understand that you might have to remove the tree. How many of you in here think you might have to remove your tree? Okay, okay. Uh, prices, Mark, can range from 750 bucks to, I'm sorry? 600 to 2,000. The larger number is based on uh, wires going through, how close it is to a structure, if they have to bring the equipment in, and all that stuff. So if the bug had never shown up to your doorstep or never came to America, we'd have that much more money to deal with, okay? So keep the price, of how much it's going to cost to remove that tree in mind when you're thinking about treatment of the tree as well, okay? So what's called deferred removal? Let's say Iowa City has, Zach, what, 2,000? Ash trees, okay? And Iowa City cannot get through all 2,000 ash trees in one year to remove those. So let's just say, they're not gonna do this, but let's just say they would do this. They would treat all the trees that they could not get to in a given year with a spray that only lasts one year. And then the next year they could get to some more and then they treat the ones they can't get to. The idea here is the longer you keep those trees healthy or alive, the less likely they're gonna be a liability to you or to the city, okay? Because 
Once these trees die, they literally have large branches fall over or the whole tree will blow over in a windstorm. That's how severe it is. Not like the American elm that would stand for years and years and years after DED hit it, that's elm disease. These ash trees break up pretty quick. So that's an issue that the city is faced with and you as homeowners are faced with, okay? So that's why we want to try to keep these alive until we can take them out. And the two ways to do that is by bark spray or a trunk injection. And I'm hoping that you picked up this publication. There's some in the back of the room, I believe, still. And if you don't have one, you might uh, raise your hand and Mike's willing to pass those out. Keep your hand up until you get one. So those are the two methods to do that. We'll talk about those specific methods in a bit. Okay, so now you know what deferred removal is. Primarily for trees that are 22 inch in diameter and smaller, okay? We're, the trees are slated for, for removal, but we can't get to them this year, and so we've gotta keep them alive as long as we can. Okay, so preventive treatments then are only for healthy candidate trees. Mike, Mark mentioned that very well. Um, so those basically are trees planted along the streets in the yard or in a park setting. If you got a windbreak with a lot of ash trees in it, probably is not going to be cost effective or a woodlot is not going to be cost effective to treat those trees. It's too expensive. Unless you have a lot of money and that's up to you if you want to put it that way. The method we want to use to treat trees to protect them from emerald ash borer is called systemic. We put it either on the plant or in the plant or around the plant. It goes into the plant and the tree then becomes toxic to emerald ash borer. It's a very simple way of doing it. It's a way that keeps um, a lower environmental impact on non-target organisms as well. So what you do need when you're using systemic is good soil moisture, because that will move the product through the tree you need newly formed leaves, and you need um, sweating. They call it transpiration in the trade, okay? The tree respires, or, and so those are, excuse me, those are best in the spring. So mid-April and mid-May is the best time to move these products through the tree, okay? Rent that tree, lets out of its bud, breaks its bud, and it's really growing well. There's good soil moisture. That's the best time to, quote, unquote, rock and roll with the treatment. There is one treatment. Uh, the active ingredient is imamectin benzoate that has a treatment window from April through August. Into September, what happens in the tree? The leaves fall off. Okay, senescence of the leaves. They start maturing and they drop off. Technically, any time after July, those leaves, if you've gotten a good full canopy off your tree up through July, man, they've done their job. August, if they fall off, no big deal. So a bug that hits only the leaves in the fall, in, the spring, in, in September, hey, that's a good, it's almost a blessing. You don't have to rake up the leaves. Okay, so we've got um, a situation, just as a reminder, Mike indicated that the females have to select the trees, and they do that by the volatiles, the chemicals that are coming off of the tree that smell like ash, okay, compared to other trees. They're keyed into that just by their makeup, genetic makeup. The females will feed for two to three weeks before she lays any eggs. How many of you like to go out and be eaten up by mosquitoes? Okay, it, you do? <laughs> A mosquito, a female mosquito must have the iron in your blood to mature her eggs. Emerald ash borer females must have the components in ash trees to mature her eggs. So she has to feed for two to three weeks, must, okay? It's not like an option that if she feels like it or whatever, she could go and feed, okay? And then she'll lay her eggs. How many eggs was it? 60 to 90 per female, and only, the female only lives for a few months or weeks or whatever, so it's not gonna be like she'll live until next year and have another 60 to 90, and then another year, they're, they're, they die in a fairly short period of time. Okay, so we really only have two windows of opportunity for treatment. 
when those females are feeding and when the larvae chew, they hatch from that egg, which is on the outside of the tree bark, and they chew through the bark into the tissue called the cambium, okay? And that's the only two place, times we could treat the, uh, the larva or the insect. And so this table, if you've got that publication, I believe it's table number two. It is, it's on the second page. And so I'm going to unfold this a little bit at a time. So the left column over here is the insecticide. Then we have whether it hits the egg stage, the larval stages, or, and then how it affects the adults. So if you're going to use a metacloprid to solve the problem, it doesn't kill the eggs, but it does kill the first instar larva but no other larval stages. So that's a really good example of how you've got to hit that first instar larva for one of the things. And then look at the right. As far as the adults feeding on the leaves, if those leaves have imidacloprid inside of them, as she feeds on them, she'll die. She must feed on them for several days to do the job though, okay? But she has to feed how long? Two, Two three weeks, okay. Again, with a high school teacher, I get in these uh, ways I have to repeat things. Let's look at the second insecticide called Dinotefuron. Again, not toxic to the eggs. It is toxic to the first couple of larval stage. But look about the adults. How many bites does it take? Just a few bites, okay? So let's look at the next one. Imamectin benzoate, it doesn't hit the egg stage. It does hit a couple of larval stages. And look at this, one or two bites is all it takes for the female to die. That's awesome. Now you say, Mark, how much stuff are we actually putting in the tree? Four milliliters for the whole tree. Four milliliters, one teaspoon. So that's not very much stuff. Yes? They have, okay, the question is, are the leaves that are toxic to the emerald ash borer adult, are they to any, toxic to anything else while they're on the tree or when they're off the tree? Either. Okay, on the tree, if a caterpillar feeds on them, yes. If they fall off the tree, no, because they've done some studies underneath the tree to find out how it breaks down of leaf litter, how it affects the microorganisms, how it affects earthworms, and so forth and so on, no effect for any of these products. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The question was about pollinators, and I'd like to bring that up if I can toward the end of this. Um, basically, the short answer is does not affect them, okay? But let me clarify that. And the last chemical that's available for treatment is called azadirectin. You ever heard of neem or the neem tree? It's the same stuff, okay? It's a bio food product, if you want to call it that. Uh, it affects the a couple of the larval stages, but look at this, it's not toxic, but it messes with the female's ability to lay a number of eggs and viable eggs, healthy eggs, so the eggs don't hatch, okay? And it also messes with the larva's ability to shed the skin to go to the next stage or even to become an adult, okay? So there are different modes of actions uh, that are at play here. And so these are the four different products that are available in our state for these treatments. Question? Yes. On the, on the previous slide, um, what, uh, what percentage of uh, effectiveness is there? Uh, is the last one, if it is a non-toxic, as far as versus the amethyst, which seems to be pretty Okay, the question was, how effective are each of these things? percentage-wise controlling insects, not hedging it, but it's gonna vary. It will vary depending on the tree and stuff. But let me just say it this way, that all these methods have proven to be successful in protecting an ash tree compared to an untreated tree. So if you don't treat your ash tree, it will die. Okay, there are some that are more effective for instance, imamectin benzoate, they're touting it to be 100% effective. I don't believe that. 
and down to uh, imidacloprid has had success rates from 70% up to 90%. And the dinotefuron, I read an article before I came down here, is almost as effective as mmectin benzoate, but not quite. Okay, so um, we're, we wouldn't recommend any insecticide if it didn't have any effectiveness that would be satisfactory. Okay, good question. Okay, this is the map of our state showing um, the different infested counties, positive counties. Each dot is where uh, Mike was able to find emerald ash borer, Mike, or somebody else find emerald ash borer. And here in Johnson County, we've got a positive, and I'm, I've got to think the dot's right there because it's based on the circle. For some reason, the dot didn't show up on that map. That's interesting. Okay, anyway, and these circles are 15 mile radius around that find, okay, that positive detection. In that 15 mile arc, all ash trees are at risk, okay? So in Johnson County, all the ash trees are at risk, okay? Now, when it came to Iowa City and you found it this year, we were doing some bark peeling this afternoon, and so those galleries are probably a couple of years old. Is that correct, Mike? Yeah. Okay, a couple of years old or so. So um, once it comes to Iowa City, it doesn't like have a napalm bomb that blows up the whole city and have these uh, insects that just go everywhere and take out all the trees. Mike said 60% of those females go to the back to the same tree. Emerald ash borer is an excellent uh, steward of its resource. I'm saying that not to belabor the point, but you have time once it's found in Iowa City to treat your trees. Okay, you probably have a year or two to make the decision, to determine if it's good and all that. Because some, all these products, my, I've been told, have curative effect as well. So once the tree is infested to a certain degree, and we'll talk about that in a bit, you could do a treatment and you could stop the infestation of that tree, of that uh, insect. Okay, so we're in the treatment zone. That's what we need to know here. There's 30 other places in Iowa that is known to be infested. Now, this is table three on your handout. In essence, there's two ways that a homeowner could do their own treatment. And one is called the granular method. That's the one that's highlighted with blue here. This is if you have a tree up to 12 inches in diameter. Now, where was that diameter measured? How many? How? Four Great, four and a half feet off the ground. Measure around that, that's the circumference, divide that by three, that gives you your diameter, roughly. Okay, so 12 inch diameter trees, you could use a granular, and I'll show you the details on that. And look at the time to treat that. It takes four to six weeks for the product to get up into the tree. When are the females active? June, June. June through August. And can you see now why mid-April to mid-May? Four to six weeks, okay? And the other method is called the soil drench method. This is up to 20 inch diameter trees, so a little bit larger tree. Once you get above 20 inch diameter trees, let the professional or the certified applicator take care of that for you, okay? And the treatment times are basically the same time, although they have early August in here for a couple of the, for each of these actually, they found that if you do a fall treatment, you have to use twice the chemical than if you do a spring treatment. So Iowa State recommends if you're going to do a homeowner method, do the spring treatment and you only have to use half as much, okay? So, yes? Can you go back to that slide? I can. The one that Mark was talking, or that you were talking about, the emomectin benzoate is not on there. That's correct. Emomectin benzoate is not available to the homeowner. Okay, thanks. That's the question. Um, uh, part of it is emomectin benzoate is a trunk injection, and to make sure you inject the tree correctly so you don't wound the tree unnecessarily, you have to have training, and um, that's the primary reason. And the first formulation for emomectin benzoate was a restricted use product, 
which mean you had to be a certified applicator in the state of Iowa. Yes, sir. Excellent point. Yes. Okay, so the op the observation was all these are neonicotinoids. So that's why we're going to be talking a little bit later about the pollinators, because we're concerned that we don't put product in the environment that could harm our pollinators, just like you are. Good point. Okay, so if you're going to do a homeowner method, you need to read the label before you buy the product because you need to know how big your tree is first. And if you go to buy the product, if you only get one bottle and you need two or three, then you gotta go back to the store again because you'll only, you won't be as effective. So read that before you purchase it. Again, the amount you buy or you put on based on that tree circumference. Now, if you look at the product label, it does not tell you the 12 inches for granular or the 20 inches for soil drench. This is based on research from Michigan State, Ohio State, and Purdue. They found out if you go above these ranges, they're not effective. But chemical companies, uh, they are, like to sell you more stuff. So we just are trying to get the word out that if you're gonna do a homeowner treatment, and this is in these, um, it's brochure that I, I've got in your hands, use these guidelines, 20 inch for soil drench and 12 inch for granular, okay? So with, this, with either one, if once you've got your ash tree there, the best scenario is for that ash tree not to have grass growing up against the tree. The best scenario beyond that is not to have hostas or other perennials against the tree. The best scenario is to either have bare soil surrounding that tree six inches or more, or to have a mulch ring around that tree. Trees like fungal environments, grasses like bacterial environments. And so if you've got a tree surrounded by grass, it's starving in some respects because the bacteria and the grass are not cooperating with the fungi that the tree roots need. So if you want to be a perfect homeowner, you take the grass out all the way out to the drip line and put in hardwood mulch. That, that's in a perfect world, I understand that, and I actually have done that with some of my trees, okay? And it does turn them around. It really does help them. So anyway, so I'm gonna take, if I've got that mulch ring around my tree, whether it be six inches or six feet, I'm gonna rake that back a foot or so, and then I'm gonna mix up my product for a soil drench based upon um, the size of the tree and, um, a couple of gallons of water. I've got my rubber gloves on, my chemical resistant gloves, and I'm gonna pour that literally right around the trunk of the tree as it goes into the ground. Not away from it, right against the tree. Okay, and if you wanna water that in, that's great. A little bit more, that's fine, you don't need to, and then you just rake it back once it's settled down in there. If you pour that product in through the mulch or a lot of plant material around there beside grass, it binds up and it won't go to the roots. That's why we ask you to do that, okay? If you're gonna do a granular method, it's the same basic thing. You pull it, the, the mulch back and then see how I pulled it back here and now I'm gonna put those granules within 18 inches of the trunk of that tree and then I have to water that in, must water it in. And whether you're doing um, a granular method or a soil drench method, let it dry thoroughly before you let the kids around it, your pets, or anything else, okay? It's just a precaution. Okay, questions on those two methods, either one of those methods? Yes? I uh, stopped by Menards today to look at what they had on the shelf there. Okay. When it came to the granular, I thought she said, and this is the one that was reading the label, which didn't look like it was that easy, uh, said something about the granular had to be three inches deep. That's okay. What it may, okay, the question was, he made an observation of a local store that he thought with the granular method, 
he understood it or the person told him that it had to be fairly deep, like three inches deep, maybe for the size of the tree that you've got. Okay, the idea is you just literally um, push that around the tree, water it in, and it goes in a little bit slowly. You gotta wait for that wire to go in and water a little bit more until it goes and dissolves in and you bring your mulch back around it. But the price of a granular treatment like that is $35 for one of those containers and for a um, soil drench, liquid is 25 bucks, okay? So it's more expensive to do the granular by 10 bucks than it is the soil drench. So whatever method you wanna do. As I mentioned before, water is a critical factor, getting that product up through the tree. Um, and then here's the that statement, I'm saying it again, all treatment methods are more Success, successful, excuse me, than if you didn't treat your ash tree. Don't be a, a ostrich type, putting your head in the sand, thinking it'll miss my ash tree. No, it won't miss your ash tree. Very effective moving through a community. Okay, treatments are done either every spring or every other year, depending on the product you use. Uh, and they must be done for several years, so you're basically looking at a commitment for a year. How many years? 15 to 20 years at least. Mike was saying that curve like 12 years out. Well, once you get up where the emerald ash borer number, the beetles have built up so much in Iowa City that they're knocking out ash trees, they gotta take them all out before they drop back down. And so it's gonna take 15 or 20 years to do that. And so if you're gonna treat your own trees, Take the cost of treatment times 20 per year times 20. Then figure out that price, compare that to how much it costs to remove the tree. Just being blunt. Yes? What if you've already had your trees injected? Okay. You still have to go through that, must be done, because that's a lot of money. $250 it cost me for each tree. Okay, the statement was made that he's had one tree. How many trees? Three trees treated, each tree cost $250. Okay, so he spent $750, and it's good for, what did they tell you, when do you have to redo that? For two years. Okay, and so instead of every year for 20 years, it's half of that number for 10 years. So you're talking 7,500 bucks for that scenario. And I could ask you a question, is there enough soil around that tree that they could do a soil injection? If, how big a diameter of trees were they? No, they're bigger than 20, I think. Okay, probably, let's, these trees are probably close to 30 years old. Okay, so 25 inch, I'm gonna say 25 inch based upon 250 bucks. It's usually $10 <coughs> per inch diameter for a trunk injection up to $25 per inch diameter okay. for trunk injection. So I could go back with the soil treatment. Well, with the 20, 25 inch tree, you can't do it yourself, but they sure can do it. Okay. And the price, even though you're doing it every year, may be cheaper if you look at the whole thing, okay. Okay, there is research looking at the frequency. Let's say all the people in this room represent the whole population of Iowa City equally. This is the number of people we have in Iowa City. If each of you go home and treat an ash tree, then in a short period of time, any unprotected ash trees that are on the fringe are gonna die and emerald ash borer will crash and so you won't have to be treating until you see symptoms again. Okay, that's what they're looking at now. They're hoping to spread these treatments out over a longer period of time. Now, this is one of my caveats, especially with the neonics, that Minnesota does, uh, Minnesota, Iowa does not have a state law to say this. Minnesota has requested setbacks, okay? And I like to follow Minnesota's idea because it's uh, a level of safety that we need to build into this. Minnesota requests 25 feet setback from any sensitive site. So if you've got an ash tree, go out 25 feet radius all the way around it and see if you have something that could be considered a sensitive issue. Flower garden, a vegetable garden, a flowering shrub, a flowering tree, surface water, any storm drains or hard surfaces, if you do, you probably should not be using a homeowner method. Should not be using a uh, neonicotinoid at all. Okay? What do you mean by hard surfaces, excuse me? Sidewalk. Sidewalk. So 
driveway. I'm sorry? Okay, if you use um, a soil method or a basal trunk spray, it could move from that site onto the hard surface, go to the storm drain and go elsewhere. Not very likely, but they're, Minnesota's idea, and I agree with them, they're building in a level of safety that we don't have by law in Iowa. Okay. Right, for the runoff, possible runoff. And it's, it's, it's the worst case scenario, let's say you put the stuff down this afternoon and tonight you get a three inch rain. If you put the, but, and that's the worst case scenario, but in the normal situations where I've talked to researchers on this, they say it will move maybe an inch from the injection or application site. That's literally how far they found it moving. But let's build a level of safety in here, okay? And the hard surface includes the house? Um, no, no, the hard surface would not include the house because um, you got your foundation there. So I'm, oh, talk, okay. I'm talking a, a, a horizontal hard, uh, hard surface. Now, the reason I say this about flowers, and vegetable garden, flowering shrubs, flowering trees, is because they found if you do a soil treatment with a neonicotinoid, one year it lasts in that plant, especially if it's a shrub or tree, for three years, one treatment. That treatment then is moved from the roots up to the leaves and also to the flowers, into the nectar, into the pollen. And that's not good for our pollinators, okay? So there are four methods that a professional could do for you if you want to protect your ash tree. Here's listed here, a trunk injection, a soil injection, usually it's within a couple of feet of that tree base, uh, a called the basal trunk spray where you're spraying five feet up and going down to the base of the, the tree and the, the soil, and then some kind of soil drench around the base of the tree, okay? So if they come to your door and say, we only have one method that can treat emerald ash borer and it's trunk injection, say, no. Say, I don't even want to hear you talking to me because I know there are four methods, okay? Now, I know I'll get some people ticked off at me when I mark. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. This is the table, the last table in the publications on page four, or modified version of it. Now you see imamectin benzoate picking up here, okay? And you see azadiractin, the neem product in here. Um, most of the others are still the neonicotinoids here, so got to keep these things in mind. Trunk injection, soil injection, soil drench, and then basal bark spray. Those are the four methods, right? And look, most of the time we're talking about the spring for an application time. The only exceptions would be anytime you uh, inject a tree trunk with imamectin benzoate or imidacloprid, you got during the spring through the fall, a full canopy. Whenever that tree could pull up the stuff, we're good to go. But remember, with imidacloprid, it's best to do it in the spring because once those leaves drop off, it's not good for the next year. Imamectin benzoate is. Yes, ma'am. Is the imamectin a neonicotinoid? Imamectin benzoate is not a neonicotinoid, okay? Called an avermectin, A-V-E-R-M-E-C-T-I-N. So there's only two products that are not every year. All these others are every year must be done a treatment. The only two that aren't is imamectin benzoate, either sold as triage or arvomectin, and the azadirectin sold as triazin, okay? I'm sorry to complicate this a little bit, but if you've got 14 ash trees like I do on three acres, a property, I may have more ash trees than I could do for a soil or a trunk, and, uh, trunk spray. There's a limit, the number of, the amount of insecticides you could put per acre. Just like a farmer has a limit on how much herbicide he could use per acre, how much insecticide she could use, or whoever's doing the farming. There's a certain limit how much they could use per acre. Same way with these products. 
if you're doing a soil treatment or a basal trunk spray. If you're doing a trunk injection, there's no limit. Now you know why some tree companies come in and say, we're going to do a trunk inject. They're not limited. They don't have to count. They don't have to figure things out. They just come in quickly, do it, and they're gone. Okay? My thought is if you're going to do a treatment and you want that tree to last for as many years as possible, you alter, you rotate the methods. Because every time you do a trunk injection, you wound the tree. But if it's a healthy tree, it should wall that off. And if you give it, let's say you do a trunk injection year one, it's good through year two. Year three, you come in with the soil treatment. Year four, you come in with the basal trunk spray. Then year five, you go back to the trunk injection. You've given that tree two or three extra years to heal those, heal those, excuse me, compartmentalize those wounds, okay? But just know that whenever you do a trunk injection, it does cause a wound to that tree. Okay, so curative options. These products usually do um, control some infestations, the EAB, if the infestation is less than a third of the crown. It's going to be less than a third. Actually, with imamectin and benzoate, half of the crown could be gone. You could go in and treat it, and it'll control it. Um, the only downside of this is <laughs> you're going to have tree branches that have been killed by the bug. And so, because of that, you're going to have to prune those out, okay? And the other branches will fill in, especially if it's only a third of the crown, all right? But just keep in mind, if you have it in your tree and you know you have it, and the third of the tree is gone, you can either protect the rest of the tree, may not result in control, <laughs> so they put that caveat on there, or take that tree out before it goes any farther because you know it's already working on the tree and you don't want it to become brittle so that the cost goes up anyway. We don't recommend canopy sprays at all. Um, get a lot of drift, hit non-target, and then very few companies in the whole state have a rig that will hit the top of an ash tree. Plus the timing's gotta be there, it's gotta be perfect. So we just don't recommend it at all. Okay, questions up to now. I'm gonna talk about pollinators here in a second. Yes. So you were mentioning hostas or other plants below your tree. Yep. Remove and treated? The question oh, is, the observation <laughs> is, and she's <laughs> coming to confession here, and saying that she's got hostas beneath her tree, around the tree. Um, the bottom line is, if you have a lot of plant material around the tree base, it encourages moisture around that tree base, okay. especially when you have to water the tree there a lot. And if you've got mulch there and everything else, it holds that moisture and encourages rot of the tree bark itself. I've had it happen, I know, with the um, property we used to live at. So the best scenario is to just have either bare soil or mulching around the base of your tree. And use your hostas or other plants elsewhere. You got them, you spent the time and the money, okay? Other questions? That's just my suggestion, it's not a commandment, you know, that. <laughs> oh. If, I'm, if one was going to treat the tree, preventative or otherwise, yep. and there was plant material below it, move that before you bother to treat it. Move the stuff around the base of the tree, whether you're doing it or professionals doing it. Okay. Yes. Because if they're going to come in and do a trunk injection, they need the base of the tree. And they may have to excavate around the base of the tree because you may have put more soil around the base of the tree than should be there. Okay. You, should, you should see, if the trunk comes down, you should see these fingers sticking out. The brace roots. If you don't see that, your tree too deep. Whether it's an inch too deep or more. Okay. So with pollinators and emerald ash borer treatments. Okay, three things that protect the pollinators from toxic pollen and nectar and ash trees. There's three things. First is ashes are wind pollinated. Okay. So if Ash tree is a tree among other sources of pollen in the area. Bees were not going to be attracted to that. If it's the only source of pollen in the area, they will take ash pollen. Okay. Little ash pollen is taken by honeybees, and that's just when there's no other flowers present. Early spring temperatures are often very cold when that ash flower is blooming. 
It's a very nondescript, basically odorless flower uh, that on the female trees only, and uh, at least the female flower is on the female trees only. And so the likelihood of the bees being out foraging at that point in, in uh, the spring is not high. So we've got three things working to help us, okay? Uh, to some degree, all active ingredients are used, that are used to protect the ash trees are toxic. Imamectin benzoate is toxic, so are neonicotinoids, so is azadirectin. All of them are. If you put them on a choice test or spray them or treat them somehow, the bees will die, okay? As will other things. And if you have flowering plants, as I said, within 25 feet of the tree, um, don't treat the ash tree with a soil treatment or trunk spray. Use a trunk injection if you must, okay? You want to protect those pollinators. You mean 25 feet from the trunk? 25 feet from the trunk. Because if you're treating around that tree and the stuff is only going to move a few inches anyway, you want to make sure that you don't have um, a flowering regelia or something else underneath that tree at the edge where some of the product could wash into the roots of those flowering shrubs. Okay. And if you've got flowering shrubs near within 25 feet, transplant them, okay? Okay, compared to contact insecticide, because that's the other option. If somebody's got to save their ash tree and, and they're going to use a contact spray, systemics are better because they're more effective against this bug. How much um, imamectin benzoate was it for the whole tree? Do you remember? Four, four, ounce, four milliliters or one teaspoon. Okay, that's not very much, okay? It minimizes off-target movement. It's better protection for the non-target organisms, okay? Are there gonna be some other non-targets that will perish possibly? Yes, you can't deny it. Um, if you lose all your ash trees though, and we don't have ash trees coming back, we're gonna lose a whole complement of wildlife that we would have had if we would have protected the ash trees understood that these products usually are only effective for two or three years, especially imamectin benzoate, and after that point in time, they lose their concentration in the leaves and the wood and whatnot. <coughs> okay, now as a consumer, please be wary uh, with it. Zach or Mark mentioned it. I guess that's time to get off the stage. Um, get two or more written estimates. Check those vendor references. Um, check for the certification. Make sure they're certified as a pesticide applicator in the state of Iowa. Ask for neighbors' references and then verify all that stuff, uh, their, their uh, treatment actions. If for some reason you feel like you've been schnookered, you've got a written estimate, you can get out of that contract if you do it within three days of when you signed it. You do have to get, generally have to get the Iowa Attorney General's office involved but that's called the Door-to-Door -door -door Sales Act okay, in Iowa. My name is Zachary Hall. I'm the superintendent of Parks and Forestry for the city of Iowa City. Um, so just to kind of uh, highlight, recap, um, some of the things that were discussed tonight. Um, District Forester uh, Vitosh brought it up um, about uh, Dutch Elms disease, which I'm glad that he brought that up. So. Um, Emerald ash borer, the effects that we're uh, seeing right now from emerald ash borer are directly related to um, what we did um, in light of uh, Dutch Elms disease. Um, it, it decimated our American elm population. Um, green ash, white ash, they started to become a viable, great uh, urban tree, and so we started to plant them um, quite frequently, developers and homeowners and whatnot. So from an urban planning perspective, um, this is something that the city of Iowa City, other communities are trying to get away from as far as repeating this pattern of essentially monocropping um, our urban forest. So our perspective is that we need to diversify. We look at this as an opportunity to do that. Um, we have approximately, and this is just anecdotal numbers from um, uh, staff historical knowledge. Um, we have no inventory yet, but uh, we approximate that we have 2,000 ash trees on public property that includes the right-of-way and park trees and then any other um, 
publicly owned uh, facilities or land. That does not include the interior forests of Ryerson Woods or Hickory Hill. Uh, we have, as, as Mike Kidner said, we have, you know, in interior woodlands, it's hard to determine those numbers. So, um, so for us, this comes down to an urban planning perspective. Um, what do we do? Um, we diversify. That's our goal. So um, diversifying. Um, Dr. Shower talked about costs and treatment options. You can see um, it gets a little complicated as far as applications, um, treatments, um, what applications can be done, timing of treatments, um, frequency of treatments, and then also costs. So for us, again, um, to get the most bang for our buck and to not, um, in our minds, uh, repeat the same issue, but get at a broader um, goal of ours, um, we are going to diversify. We are not going to treat. We are going to remove um, our 2,000 ash trees. So I know some of you may have uh, ash trees in your right away. We had one question. Um, I know the question's been uh, brought up. What if I decide to treat my ash tree in my right away? Currently, with the codes and policies that we have in place, um, it's no different if you decide to go out and fertilize your tree in the right of way, and for whatever reason. Um, health and uh, public health uh, wise as far as it becoming a hazard, we come and remove it. So same scenario. Um, so um, getting back to um, diversification, I know uh, District Forester Vitosh was going to talk about selections and I think uh, you have some information that we can share after the fact via website or something like that. Okay, so as far as uh, species selection, um, internally we are working on uh, a list of our own. We have a little bit more unique scenarios. You know, we're dealing with uh, downtown trees, trees and planters in downtown, very harsh environments. Um, most of the time roadways, so you're dealing with salt sands, um, you know, road grime, um, pollution from vehicles. So, you know, the trees that we put in are always in stressed environments. So getting back at uh, what we had covered as far as an ash tree, you know, 40 to 50, 40 to 70 years old, um, a number of the ash trees that we have in our right-of-ways are, are in those, and you can directly see those, again, going back to the uh, Dutch Elms disease scenario, that these were planted when these subdivisions went in. I can tell you I live in a subdivision that was put in in the 50s and 60s. I had a nearly 60-year-old ash tree. I removed it last year not specifically because it's an ash, but because it had other defects, similar to District Forge or Vitosh uh, in his tree, uh, because it had other defects right by my house, right by the driveway. I knew this was coming. Um, I'd rather replant. And so that's what I did personally. So um, that's, that's what we're choosing to do as far as the city is concerned. I can tell you two things that um, are coming out of this that is great for our urban forest and great for our forestry program is one, um, council has recognized the need for a tree inventory. We do not currently have one. Um, that, that is something that is coming out of that. So we, we do have some funding available. So we will be uh, <coughs> getting a tree inventory. We'll, we're gonna have a consultant come in and do that um, within the next couple of years. Uh, uh, City Cedar Wrap is just finished their process and they've selected a, a vendor, so uh, other communities in the area are doing it as well. Uh, the second component that's exciting uh, for us from an urban forest standpoint, and I think organizationally, I think community-wide for uh, Iowa City is that we're working on a partnership right now with the University Power Plant um, to see what kind of, um, what kind of goals we can uh, help them with. I know they have sustainability goals uh, for 2020. They do some um, wood burning within their, their power plant processes. And so we're looking, working with the uh, landfill and the power plant um, if, we can, if we can help with that or if we can you know, feed into that with, this, with all the urban lumber that's gonna be coming out. Um, off of that, the landfill is looking at changing you know, how they, their operations are, are going to be affected. So, um, you know, it, you'll probably in the near future see not only, you know, wood chips available, but potentially uh, lumber. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked with the University um, uh, Forestry Group and, and they've had 
um, one person interested in milling operations. So um, for us, that's exciting that we're going to look at a different way to deal with our essentially wood waste. Thank you all. You're watching City Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.